picture this. You have just been summoned to the greatest recognition and reward ceremony of your life. You are about to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords so as to be recognized and rewarded for the service and obedience that you have rendered to him since the day you became a Christian. And as you are standing before him, you and him, he on the throne, you standing before him, and he begins to review your life with you, and your memory all of a sudden is refreshed so that you are able to recall with vivid clarity all of the sacrifices that you made for Christ, all of the money that you gave for His cause, all of the people that you shared Christ with, all the hours you spent on church building projects, all the time you invested in ministry to others, all the battles that you fought for Him, every word that you uttered on His behalf, as your memory is vividly refreshed and it is all coming back, you're able to recall it all as the Lord goes through all of it. And you're beginning to relive all those moments and you begin to contemplate the fact that that you're going to be rewarded for this and you're going to have crowns to throw at Christ's feet. All of a sudden, you're brought back to the present by words you never in all of your life expected to hear. Oh, my dear child, you wasted it all. You were so busy, so very, very busy, busy but you wasted it all because in everything that you did for me you did not live as a thankful person and thus nothing you did for me was done as an act of worship and you wasted your life man oh man can you imagine Standing before Christ at the Bama Seat Judgment and having him say to you or having him say to me that we wasted our lives as Christians because we did not worship him. And everything is supposed to flow out of worship. Everything we do has to flow out of worship or it's a total waste. And he says, you didn't worship me because you were not thankful You didn't live as a thankful person. I read a sentence the other day that really engaged me and captivated my thoughts this week. In fact, it convicted me. It convicted me. I don't know who wrote it. I don't know who said it. But here's what it says. An ungrateful person will acknowledge God but won't worship Him. An ungrateful Christian will acknowledge God, but will not worship God. Now, that's a powerfully convicting and penetrating statement. And the problem with the statement is it's true. Look with me at Luke 18. Luke 18. We have communion today, and I told Dan that I was going to shorten things up a little bit. I told Kelly that I sent her the manuscript of the message so that she can sign it, and it kind of gives her advance notice of any weird words I'm going to use, things like that. And the thing is, what she has is what I originally plan, and it's shorter. If it goes longer, it's because of what the Lord adds, okay? So that's the way the Lord... We, there is a real dynamic in preaching. I have this idea of where I'm going, but see, as I'm talking to you, the Spirit of God talks to me. And there's this dynamic up here. Something's just flood my soul and just come out. So anything that's over and above what she has, that's what the Lord added, Okay? My part will be short and on time. The Lord's part might be long. So look at Luke 18. Look at verse 11. Luke 17. Let's try there. That's always a terror when you look at the verse and you say, that's not the right one. Look at Luke 17. There's ten lepers. They're in a village and Jesus comes into the village 
The ten leopards know who he is. They know that he has the ability to heal them. And so as he enters the village, verse 12, they stood at a distance. They raised their voices. They said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. As they were going, they were cleansed. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. That word for glorify is the word for worship. Worshiping God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. His worship was his thanksgiving. In other words, the reason why he was worshiping was because he was thankful. His heart was filled with gratitude. And out of that gratitude came out worship. And out of that worship came this act of falling on his face before the Lord and giving him the glory for what he had done. And the thing was, he was a Samaritan. He wasn't even a Jew. Now look at verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? The nine were Jews. They should have known what the proper response was to an act of God on their behalf. They're rushing off to the priest so they can show him that they've been cleansed so that he will declare that they're clean and they can enter back into society. They don't got time to stop and worship because they're not thankful. But one was thankful, and he worshipped. And his worship became an act of glorifying God that ends up in the Word of God. Now, that's the reason why I say you cannot worship God and be unthankful at the same time. Our gratitude to God, our thankfulness to God, is a motivating factor in our worship of God. It's not that we are indebted to God for our, the great work he's done. And so out of our thankfulness, we try to pay him back. We can never pay God back. But our gratitude is a motivator that causes us to worship God and then to act and serve God out of that worship. Now, I think that if I could change that sentence just a little bit, and I don't think it needs changing. But if I could, what I would say is simply this. An ungrateful person can acknowledge God. The nine acknowledged him as Jesus' master. So an ungrateful Christian can acknowledge God, but cannot worship God. You see, sometimes we acknowledge God, but we don't worship God. Sometimes when we gather together like this, all we're doing is acknowledging God, but not worshiping God because we didn't come into this place very thankful. In fact, sometimes we just don't live thankful lives. And so we acknowledge God and we're like the person that will stand before him at the Bama seat who has done great works for God, has acknowledged God all his or her life, but they never once did one of those works of worship out of a heart that was thankful. And it was a waste because nothing was done from worship. If we're not thankful and being thankful is very important, and we're going to see that today, especially in light of Thanksgiving right around the corner. If we are not thankful in any given situation, especially those seemingly bad situations, it is because we are not recognizing God's worth. We are either diminishing his sovereignty, saying that he was unable to keep this bad thing from happening to us, and therefore you can't give God his proper worth if you're diminishing something about him. Or if you believe in his sovereignty, but you still think it was a bad situation, you're diminishing his goodness. You're saying, well, he certainly was sovereign and he certainly was able to keep this from happening, but he's not good. And that's why it happened. Listen, whenever you and I are unthankful in any given situation, whether good or bad, we are not worshiping God. Because you are diminishing something about the worth and the worthiness of God. The other way in which we don't worship God when we are unthankful is the fact that 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 commands us to give thanks in everything because this is what? 
God's will for us. So to not be thankful is what? Sin. Because if God's will for us is to be thankful in every situation, and we are not thankful in every situation, we are now in sin because we violated God's will, therefore we're not worshiping God. That's why I say thankfulness, gratitude, living as a grateful, thankful Christian is imperative to the Christian life. It's imperative to worship. You cannot worship God apart from being thankful. And if we are not worshiping God, we are wasting our lives. So this issue of whether we are thankful people is a very important one, as there can be no true worship without it, and therefore there can be no true Christianity without it. When we don't live as thankful people, we are not living as worshipers of God, and we are not living as Christians. You know, I have found that Christians who are genuinely thankful and grateful to God for His wonderful gift of salvation, are people who typically don't waste their lives complaining about their troubles, grumbling about their circumstances, criticizing others, regretting what could have been, and generally bemoaning the sorry condition of life around them. Rather, what I've observed is that Christians who are genuinely undone by the fact that God has forgiven them, justified them, saved them, and given them new life in Christ, is that they give themselves to worshiping Christ in every aspect of their lives by living thankfully. Now, I think this is why we're commanded in Scripture to be thankful in all things. God doesn't want us to waste our lives. Because when we are unthankful, we are wasting our lives. You know, this morning, as we're getting ready for church, Peter is standing there. He says, I don't want to go to church. It's all right. He'll never remember me saying this, okay? He'll lose his memory. He's not even three. I don't want to go to church. But Peter, why don't you want to go to church? I don't want to go to church. Okay. Okay. But, but we're going to go worship Jesus. I don't care. I don't want to go worship Jesus. I don't want to go to church. But Mike is going to be there. Oh, well, maybe I'll go to church. But, you know, anyway, even that wasn't going to get him. You know what finally get him? If you don't go, you're going to get a spanking. Oh, I'm headed right there. Where's my shirt and pants and tie? You know. But he's going to go to church now. But, you know, that's a little guy that's just not even three years old. How many adults in here didn't want to come to church this morning. Don't put your hands up, please. Yeah, worked all day at the church building project, lost half my weekend doing that. Now they expect me to come over to church, sit on my can, listen to that windbag for go for about an hour and a half. Then we're going to have announcements for another hour and a half. Then we're going to do a communion. That'll be at least an hour and a half. And then they expect me to go listen to another windbag in Sunday school. Okay, I'm one of those windbags too, okay? And, and then there's the other half, that's not half, that's two quarters, that, that's the rest of my day is shot. Then, to top it off, we're doing church again at night. And heaven knows how long that's going to last. I mean, my whole weekend has just been destroyed by church. I don't want to go to church. So you came into church anyway because you knew in the back of your mind, just like Peter did, I'm probably going to get a spanking if I don't go somewhere along the line, so I'm going to go. I don't want to, but I will go, and God will simply bless my duty. Man, I don't know who ever taught you that. Because that's a heresy out of the pit of hell. I don't know who ever taught you that God is going to bless your dutiful obedience and sacrifice and your dutiful worship. Because I don't find it in here at all. In fact, I can take you to... Many, many verses that God says you better serve him with what? Gladness and delight and joy and happiness. And be thankful that we have the opportunity to come and worship the great King of kings and Lord of lords. Because here's the alternative. If you're not a worshiper of God, in other words, he has not called you as a worshiper whether you are worshiping or not. If you're a Christian, you've been called as a worshiper. You know what the alternative is? 
to have not been called and an eternity in hell. Now, I think that puts a little perspective on it, doesn't it? Wow. I don't like the, pers- the, the alternative to that. This is a message for all of us. The message for me, very convicting. Before I preached this, I had to get with my son Luke and my wife and, and those that were of the age of accountability and knew anything about anything I did. I don't mean accountability in terms of salvation, just who can hold me accountable. Um, and, and, and say, you know what? What you're going to hear me talk about today is I, I, I have a struggle living this way. I struggle living thankfully. Okay, I, I've got one of those personalities that when I walk in, I, I see things, and, I, and what I see is usually what's wrong before I see what's right. So I look at a row of chairs, a building full of chairs, I see the one row that's not right. And I don't see the nine that are straight. I see the one that's wrong. And my, and my, my, my personality drives me, I've got to fix that row. If, if this isn't right, I'm going to fix it. I'm, I'm a fixer. I'm a problem solver. That's why most cops are problem solvers. Yes, lady, give me the facts. I fix it. Good. We're done. See you. Now, that doesn't work in marriage real well, does it? Okay? <laughs> okay? But that's me. And so I tend to not live as thankfully as I should. And I did an inventory this week, and I'm thinking, oh, my heavens, Lord. There's going to be a lot of things I thought I was going to be rewarded for, and I think it's going to all come up a waste. So I sat down, and I made this list of everything I needed to, to apologize for and to confess to the Lord and say, Lord, this and this and this and this, and I have not done it out of a thankful heart. Boy, could you have a little mercy and cut me just a little bit of slack? I would like at least one crown to throw at your feet. Just one, half a crown would be good. I struggle with this kind of stuff, and I think that some of us do. It is hard to live thankfully all the time. What does all this have to do with Romans chapter 3? Turn there, and I'll show you. Romans chapter 3. We're going to survey the next few verses. We've been in this passage for quite some time in which we have looked at who we were and what we were like before we were saved. And I don't think that any of us have any illusions about the fact that we were good people who are worthy of God's notice and mercy before he saved us. I mean, you come to Romans chapter 3, and, and God pretty much destroys all the illusions of goodness that you thought you had. And so I don't think any of us are under that illusion that we deserve to be saved. And, and this morning, I want to apply this to our lives in light of the fact that we're coming up on Thanksgiving. And what I want us to see is that in light of who we were, in our unsaved condition and what we were like and what we were doing and the fact that God did not have to save us, but God in his mercy and in his grace reached down and initiated a relationship with us and called us to himself and then changed our hearts so that we could see him and gave us eyes that could see him and made himself irresistible to us in light of everything that he did for us so that he could forgive us and declare us righteous and give us a relationship with him, we ought to be thankful people. When you think of the fact that he took care of the biggest problem you and I ever could have without our help and our cooperation in any way, shape, or form, and gave us new life in Christ, there's simply no reason that we should not be thankful people. And so as we survey these verses I want us to see that. And if you're struggling with being a grateful and thankful Christian, perhaps it may occur to you like it occurred to me that we have forgotten who we were and what we were before God so mercifully saved us. And maybe we should take some time today and look at the cross. I think that every time we complain or grumble or criticize, we probably need to stop, confess our sin And take a look back at the cross and who we were and what we were and probably who we are right now. Because some of us haven't progressed a whole lot further than that. But we're going to look at this and see why God says we ought to be thankful people. It says here in Romans 3, 9, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Again, there's that question. Were we any better than they? And that's why we're saved and they're not? Not at all. 
And he begins to give this great description of, of what we were like. In verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. We finished that up last week. That was our character. In our character, we were not righteous. We had no spiritual understanding. We had no affections for God whatsoever. Now, picture this as a spring. You, you're in the mountains. You've been deer hunting. You're thirsty. You forgot to fill your canteens. You've walked further than you intended to. You're really thirsty, and you come upon some water that's flowing down this little, little bitty brook there. It's clear. It's cold. It's refreshing. You look at it. You, take, you want to take a drink out of it, but something tells you, you know, maybe I ought to walk upstream just a little bit here and make sure this is really as clean as it appears. You walk up, and finally you come to the source of the spring, and there in the, the, the hole of the rock as the spring is coming out is a dead, maggot-infested rabbit laying in the water. Now, a mile downstream, you never would have known. That water looked clear. It looked refreshing. It probably would have tasted good and it would have poisoned you. What God is saying here is this, is that the mouth of the spring, the source of the spring, the character of the man was ruined, depraved, corrupted, radically corrupted. There was no righteousness. There was no spiritual understanding. There was nothing in him that desired God. And therefore, everything that proceeded out of that spring, out of his heart, was going to be evil. And that's where we get to the actions now. Look at verse 12. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. The word useless there is a word that simply means rotten. It was often used in, in the, the marketplace of milk or fruit or food that had spoiled and was of no value. They couldn't sell it. It had no worth anymore. And since this corruption occurred at the very heart of hearts of a man, everything that he did before salvation was corrupt and without value as far as God was concerned. And so here in verse 12, what God is simply telling us is that before salvation, we were desperately wicked and reprehensible in our conduct. Listen, if our character is bad, if the essence of who we are is corrupted and depraved, then everything about us is going to be depraved. Our, our conduct is not going to be that which brings honor and glory to God. And he says, everybody's turned away. They've all become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And then he moves on to conversations. Again, we'll come back and deal with these a little bit more in detail later, but today I just want to survey them. Look at verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. So he moves from our conduct. There's nothing that we do that is good as far as God is concerned. Let me back up just a second. That doesn't mean that an unsaved person does as bad a thing as he could possibly do, or that he never does things that would be considered good. What it means is he cannot do anything that is good in God's eyes. He cannot do anything that merits God's praise or merits God's blessing or God's grace because he's corrupted in his heart of hearts. Okay, But then when you come to the conversation, and it says this, their throat's an open grave, with their tongues they keep deceiving, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. God says not only is their conduct reprehensible and desperately wicked, but so is their words. So are their words. So are their conversations. Now, I think there's a, a great description here, especially when he uses the asp. The asp was a viper or a snake. And, you know, you can see a snake, and that snake has the poison that will hurt you located where? It's in the mouth. How is it delivered to you? Through a bite. And what he's saying is this. You, know, you can look at people, and you can be worried about all kinds of body parts hurting you or hitting you. And, you know, that old saying, what, rock, stone, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. Remember that? I used to say that. My mom taught me that. And when I was going to school, I used to say that quite a bit. Yeah, it seemed like we were always throwing bad words at each other and, 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 and hurting each other with our words when I was going to the bus stop and back and forth from the bus stop. And uh, we'd get in fights, and she'd say, well, just remember, sticks and stones, you know. Um, I forgot the thing. What was this, what's the saying again? They break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, the fact is, words do hurt you, don't they? 
sometimes words hurt worse than the sticks and stones, don't they? I mean, the sticks and stones leave bruises that heal. Sometimes those words don't ever heal. And things that you have been told when you were a young person may even be hurting you today. Well, what Paul is saying is like a snake. The poison, that which is going to hurt you, is in the mouth. And he says, not only is our conduct reprehensible before God, but so is our words. And look at how he describes it in verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. He's given the same picture of that spring. He says, listen, at at the source of their words, it's like an open grave in which they are, are talking And it's dead. It's vile. It's a body that is being corrupted. And so everything that's going to come out of their mouth is going to be corruptible. He goes on and and then he says in verse 15 and 16 and 17, he starts to talk about our relationships or our connections with people. And he says their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. He says, you know, not only is your conduct desperately wicked and reprehensible in my sight, not only are your conversations desperately wicked, but your connections, your relationships, they're not what they ought to be. And before salvation, what God is saying is, you know what, you couldn't have an honorable, godly relationship. Oh, you may have one that looked like it, but down deep there was simmering bitterness and evil and wickedness. What he's saying is that we didn't know how to treat people correctly. We didn't want to treat people correctly. And that our feet were swift to shed blood. The idea there is that when somebody did something to you that should not have been done, your feet were swift to get your revenge. You were ready to take vengeance. You were ready to get back what was yours. There was very little sanctity of human life in your heart. And then he moves on to verse 18. And he says, not only were you desperately wicked in your conduct and in your conversation and in your relationships, but also in your conceit. Look at verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And the reason that there's no fear of God before their eyes is because they were consumed with themselves. They didn't have a fear of God because they thought that they were bigger than God. They had no need for God. They had no regard for God. They were able, thought they were able to live life apart from God. And he begins again just to tell us this little description of this is what you were like before you were saved. You weren't good in your conduct. You had a potty mouth. You couldn't get along. You were conceited. You had no use for me whatsoever. And then he comes down to verses 19 and 20, and he gives us the desperateness of our condition. Look what he says. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now what he's saying here is this, that as a result of having a polluted heart, a depraved heart, a radically corrupted heart that was not righteous, our conduct, our conversation, our relationships with other people, our relationship with God was corrupted so that essentially everything about us as human beings was desperately wicked, lost, worthless and without hope in God's eyes. And that as God saw us, not only were we under the power and corruption of sin, we were also under the condemnation of his own righteous law. And to make matters worse, there was nothing that you and I could do about it. There wasn't nothing we could do about it. We just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Our condition was hopeless There was simply nothing we could do to make things right with God. Not even keeping his law as if that were even a possibility. And he says in verse 19 again, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. We were all under the law. We were guilty under God's law. And look at this next phrase. So that every mouth may be closed And all the world may become accountable to God. Listen, when the unbeliever stands before God at the great white throne judgment, 
He is not going to be offering excuses and complaints and alibis. His mouth is going to be closed. He will have nothing to say. He is probably going to be petrified as he stands before the Almighty in all of his glory on that throne. And as the books are open and as Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, goes through his works and shows him why he is being condemned to hell, the unbeliever will have no excuses. His mouth will be closed because he knows At that point, he will know that he is accountable to God and he has no excuse whatsoever. That's where we were. That's who we were before salvation. And had God not been merciful and God had taken your life, you would have stood before him with nothing to say. Guilty as charged. No hope for us at all unless God himself would reach down and do something that we could not and would not do. There would be no hope for us unless God would initiate a relationship with us and God would reverse the corruption of our sinful hearts and pay for all the evil that we had done and give us a new heart that instead of being polluted at its very source, was as righteous as God's himself. And that's what God did. Look at verses 21 through 24. But now, apart from the law, listen, there's not a single person who could have kept the law. And God says, listen, your salvation is not going to come through keeping the law. It's not going to come through good works. If the spring is polluted... It can't produce good works. It would have been impossible to have earned your way into heaven. So apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Now, some people have missed the point. They go back to the question up in verse 9. And this all ties back to that question. What then are we better than they? In other words, was there a reason why God saved us and didn't save someone else? Is there a reason why we heard the gospel and we responded and someone else didn't? Is there a reason why I'm going to heaven and someone else isn't? And they'll come down and say, there's the answer. Because we have believed. Well, let me just say this. Yes, you had to believe, but that's not the answer. Go a little bit further and I'll show you the answer. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And look at verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Yes, you believed and you were saved. But the fact that you believed was because you were given a gift. God reached down into your life, regenerated you, gave you a new heart that not only could believe, but wanted to believe. Have you ever looked at your life and said, you know, what was it in my life? I mean, for 36 years, I just lived life and I could care less about God. I didn't want God. There was nothing about God that interested me. And then all of a sudden, in one evening, my heart did a complete turnaround. And and I wanted God and I got saved and I believed in God and I prayed the prayer. And here I am. What happened? Did I all of a sudden wake up? Well, in, in a sense, you were woken up. It wasn't you. It was God. It wasn't you. You would have kept going your own way. It was God at that moment in time from all of eternity. He had called you and chosen you. And he had determined that that moment in your life was going to be the moment he was going to wake you up. And you believed. So what's the difference? Are we any better than they? No. God says it was all of him, not of you. We have so much to be thankful for. 
we who were utterly sinful, utterly depraved, totally corrupted, of no value, no value. And you say, well, man, you know, you hear, I hear all these songs on the radio talking about how, how valuable we were to God. I tell you what, the scriptures don't say that. He loved us, yes. But until he saved us, there was no intrinsic value in you and me. We were rotten to the core. And he saved us. We who were deplorably and detestably unrighteous, without value to God, were all of a sudden declared righteous by God on the basis of Christ's sacrificial death on the cross in our place as our substitute when he redeemed us from the just penalty for our sins. And whereas we're going to spend a whole lot more on this, don't think that we're moving into Romans 4 here, okay? No, we're we're going to come back and deal with some of these points in weeks to come because they're very important. But let it suffice us to say right now that in using the phrase, down in verse 24 being justified is a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in christ jesus let it suffice us to say that in using the phrase the redemption that is in christ jesus paul is making this point that in order for salvation and don't miss this that in order for salvation to be free for us in order for it to be free for you and free for me God paid the price for it. He paid the price for it in his son, Christ Jesus, by crushing and killing his own son as he hung on the cross in our place as our substitute, bearing our sin and bearing our shame. And to whom did God pay the price of his own son's death on the cross, so to save us, to none other than himself. Don't say to Satan, don't ever say that. Please don't say that. It was paid to himself. His own holiness. His righteousness. You see, he couldn't just forgive us by wiping our sin under the rug. It had to be paid for. And so the payment, the satisfaction was for him so that he could be just and the justifier of us. And so every ugly, horrid bit of our sin was paid for so that we would be able to enjoy him and his love and his smile for all of eternity. Oh, how much we who know Christ have to be thankful for. Especially when our salvation is seen in light of our sin. And who God saw us to be. And what God saw us to be. So, with all this in mind, what keeps any of us from living our lives thankfully and graciously? You know, a great many of us waste precious moments of our life complaining, criticizing, grumbling, feeling sorry for ourselves, and just be plain being negative and downright mean. I mean, I have seen Christians just downright mean. And I've wondered in my own heart of hearts how many of those wasted, precious moments does it take before you wasted a life? How many precious moments can you waste complaining and criticizing and grumbling and bemoaning Before you waste your life. It's a good question, isn't it? And the remedy for wasting our lives by being chronic complainers and critics of others is to take a good hard look at the cross and who we were. Because none of us were the epitome of virtue. We are the exact opposite. And when we do that and we see all he's done for us, is there really any reason for us not to live as thankful people, being a blesser, blessing rather than asking for one? Complimenting people instead of criticizing them? Instead of complaining when cut off in traffic, stuck in a line or taken advantage of, praying for the one who offended us? 
Instead of grumbling about how bad life is, we thank God for how good it is and how much we're still able to enjoy Him being the wicked sinners we are. Instead of holding a grudge against someone, we extend forgiveness. Instead of bemoaning the fact that we are in a church in the middle of a building program and that our time, our energy, our resources, our efforts are necessary to success, we thank God we're in a church that isn't a building program. You know how many Christians don't get the opportunity to start a church for God's glory in a community that could use one? What a blessing. Instead of looking for recognition, we give it. Instead of being hoping someone else picks up the tab, we intentionally pick it up and pay it. Some of you, I, I, you know, I have to fight for that bill with some of you. There's some in here that are very clever in how they take the bill. But I'm on to you. Instead of waiting for a greeting and you just stand there in church, well, nobody greeted me today. Go greet somebody. Give them a hug. Instead of worrying and stressing about all our problems so as to give the impression that we don't have a Heavenly Father who loves us and cares for every need, we give thanks for our problems, knowing that these are God's provision of grace to us in that moment. What a challenge for all of us. What a challenge for me. And we must take up the challenge because the alternative is to live unthankfully and ungratefully and waste our lives as Christians who, while acknowledging God, cannot worship Him. And that would be a wasted life indeed. Father, we thank You for Your Word, for what You have done for us. Oh, keep us from wasting our lives by living unthankful lives. Don't let us waste our lives by wasting precious moments grumbling and complaining and criticizing. God, call us out of this in such a way that we leave these sins behind. Take up the challenge and live thankful lives. And not waste them. In Jesus' name.